you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, welcome back here. We're still speaking to uh, General McGill, Alexander. We ended the last episode, he's getting ready to leave uh, Taiwan. Uh, we was the last uh, South African military attaché. And then something happens. And only he can tell this story, which I must say to you is one of the most fascinating I've ever heard in my life. So, sir, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. And uh, it's over to you. We are listening. We were about two months from going back home permanently. But now I had to get my office closed in those two months. And we got a message to say that Anne's dad was very, very ill. He was, he was quite old. He was 80 years old. And... Um, uh, it didn't, it looked bad. It looked as if he wasn't going to make it. So uh, I got permission for her to fly back. So she flew back. And uh, even before uh, anything, I'd, I'd been told that, that you know, it, he's, he's not going to make it. So you'd better come as well. So I got permission and I got, and before I got back to, to South Africa, he died. So we were down there in the Cape uh, for the funeral and so on, and to give her mom a bit of support and, and so on. And then we, we went back to, uh, to Taiwan. Um, and it was less than two weeks after we got back from his funeral that uh, the hostage taking took place. Six weeks before we were due to leave Taiwan. Now, as far as the the events around the hostage are concerned, taking is concerned. Um, the the safety and security in Taiwan was very different from South Africa, for instance. There was very very little violent crime, very little. There was quite a lot of of white collar crime, fraud, and um, you know that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of that took place, and you had to be very careful with transactions and so on that that you weren't diddled out of, out of money. Um, but violent crime, almost unheard of. It was safe for young women to walk around at night on the streets of Taiwan. They were safe. Children could walk about during the day in the streets. Uh, it really wasn't a big problem. Um, you really didn't have to lock your your uh, windows and doors at night because people didn't break in. You know, it was it was just not a problem. And the police were they didn't take nonsense. They were acted against criminals, and so it was it was a dicey business to 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 get involved in crime. And the Taiwanese have the death penalty, and it was uh, death by by shooting. They they shot you in the back of the head when for to execute you. Um, and uh, you know they would do it for for relatively small crimes by by our standards. Uh, so they took no nonsense over there, and you didn't have violent crime. Uh, it wasn't prevalent there. I mean, it did take place, but there there really wasn't very much. But then, about seven months before this, a gang in Taiwan commenced with a a, a reign of terror. It was a gang of three guys. And the the, uh, the leader of the gang was a fellow called Chen Chenxing. Now Chen uh, was, as far as I could ascertain later when I did some research into his background and so on, it seems that he'd been in the Taiwanese Marines for his national service, for his, uh, his, his military conscription. So he'd been very well trained because they did, offered probably the best training that Marines and the paratroopers offered the best training in the in the Taiwanese military. So he'd been very well trained. Um, but he'd grown up in bad circumstances, brought up by his grandmother, a uh, very poor background, um, and been subjected to violence himself. And uh, and he, he, he'd been in and out of prison quite a few times for, for crimes that he had committed. But he'd, he'd become a, a, an habitual criminal. Um, and this gang, uh, they were guilty of murder, um, of rape, of arson, uh, larceny, um, assault, 
uh, intimidation, kidnapping, uh, almost every crime you could think of, particularly those that involved some form of violence and destruction. Um, those, those are the sort of things that they were involved in. And, and their, their, uh, their, 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 their program of, I don't think it was a set program, but it, the, the actions that they did were intensifying and, and people were, were getting very nervous about this gang and the police couldn't catch them. They couldn't find them. Um, then they carried out something, uh, a kidnapping, which, which shocked the whole of Taiwan. It was a television uh, actor, not an actress, a presenter, television presenter, very well known in in, in Taipei, uh, uh, Bai Bing Bing. Uh, she, uh, a very attractive woman and, and a very uh, a vital sort of announcer on, on TV. Um, she had a, a daughter of 17 who was on her way to school and she was kidnapped uh, by these three. And they sent the mother a letter demanding a ransom. I think they asked for something like 5 million uh, US dollars that they wanted in ransom. Um, and just to show that they were deadly serious about this, they, they cut off her little finger and sent it to the mother with the uh, ransom note. Now, the, the mother went to the police about it which was the right thing to do. And so the police said, well, you know, you make the arrangements with them that you're going to hand over the money and uh, we'll lay an ambush to catch them. And this is what they did. But the, um, the, 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 the gang got wind of what was happening. And when they tried to arrange the whole ambush and the meeting and so on, everything went wrong and the, these guys ran off and they couldn't catch them. Um, but they found out who they were and, and who the leader was. So they got hold of his wife, Chen's wife, Chen Chen Xing's wife, and they arrested her as an accomplice, saying that she had been an accomplice to hiding the, uh, the guys from the law and for keeping the uh, the girl who'd been kidnapped in uh, uh, in uh, detained in the house. Now, whether that was so or not, we never really found out. But there was a lot of questions around that because it seems that she she actually signed an admission of guilt, and and she was sentenced to I think twelve years in prison as an accomplice. But but in actual fact, uh, further investigations proved that the police had tortured her until she signed the confession. Uh, you know, amongst other things, making her sit naked on a block of ice uh, until she was nearly frozen, um, things like that. So, um, you know, there were there were there was a lot of questions around what what actually happened and what didn't. I don't I don't really know um, what what did happen or not. But the fact is, these three guys, after the kidnapping and the ransom meeting, went for a, a ball. They, uh, they, they, they raped the young 17-year-old girl and killed her. And they turfed her body into a ditch on the side of the road, and the body was found there. So this produced a, an outcry in Taiwan, an absolute outcry. And the police launched a huge manhunt, but they couldn't seem to get these guys. And there were, um, was a shootout with the police. They eventually got information that they were in a certain part of the city and they cornered them there. And there was a Wild West shootout and in this highly populated built up area. And, um, and, and uh, two of them got away. One of them was killed. Uh, Chen Chen Xing got away with one of the other guys. And later they, they heard that there was a, that these guys were in a brothel somewhere. And the police went charging down the street with sirens blaring, and they arrived at the brothel and tried to surround it and, and 
Chen Chen Xing and this other guy bailed out of the windows and were shooting at the police in the streets. And, and the, the one guy shot himself when he realized he'd been cornered by the police and, and Chen Chen Xing got away again. So now he's the only guy left. And, and uh, um, all of this is in the media and in the newspapers and, and the television and so on. And, 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 you know, the police are being accused of incompetence and, and the people in Taiwan were feeling so insecure that, that they arranged a huge uh, protest in front of the, uh, the, the, the government buildings, uh, demanding that the uh, Minister of Police must uh, resign because uh, they can't, can't catch these guys and people are feeling insecure. It, were, it was a huge issue in Taiwan because nothing like this had ever happened before. <coughs> the, um, the, the, when there were still two of them left, they decided that they, they're going to try and, and, and escape by changing their appearance. So they, they went into a plastic surgeon's office and they held him up at gunpoint. Him and his wife and his nurse. And they forced him to perform surgery on their eyes to try and change the shape of their eyes. Um, and then they raped the wife and the nurse, and they shot all three of them dead, shot them in the back of the head. So these were these were these were these were bad guys. They were they were, and they were um, they were they were all sorts of um, uh, uh, reports appearing in them in the media. And these uh, every time a report, people were seeing Chen Chen Xing any everywhere. You know, he's, there were wanted posters all, all over the city with the three guys' faces on them. And as each one would get shot in encounters with the police, they would draw a cross through that, that uh, photo on the wanted posters. And eventually, you know, they had crosses through two of the po photos, and it was only Chen Chen Xing's photo that was left there. And, and when a report would be received that Chen Chen Xing had been seen in a certain area in, in Taipei, the property prices would drop. And, and they, they arrested and they, or they kidnapped a couple of, of businessmen and then forced them to, uh, to give them money. Uh, and so businessmen were leaving Taiwan to go and live in, uh, stay in other places. They were too frightened to stay there. It, it had become, it, because it was something like this was so unknown in Taiwan, it is unbelievable. People wouldn't go out at night. Uh, the streets of parts of Taipei City were deserted at night. The, the, you cannot believe the effect that all of this was having on, on, the, on the people. Um, the TV coverage, there were, there, there were three TV stations in Taiwan, and, and they were all giving major coverage to this thing. Um, the the uh, Chen Chen Xing then started sending letters. Nobody knew where he was because what he did was he'd steal a scooter because there's scooters all over Taiwan. He'd steal a scooter and he'd wear the, the helmet that you with a, with a visor on in front and he'd ride around with that. And so nobody would know that it's him. Uh, and, you know, then he'd dump the scooter and he'd steal another scooter somewhere and then he'd take that and ride around. And uh, so, you know, nobody knew where this guy was or how he was surviving or what was going on. And then he started sending letters to the press, to the media, saying, my wife was not involved. I will hand myself over to the police because he knew that the manhunt was going to close, was closing in on him. Uh, they would uh, they would get hold of him at some stage. Now, one also needs to know that Taiwan is a gun free society. The only people who have guns in Taiwan are the police and the military. No one else. You're not allowed to own not any kind of private firearm in Taiwan. Nobody. But these guys had firearms. And, you know, the crooks will get firearms. You can make any laws you like. The crooks will find a way to get firearms. And they, they had firearms. And they had plenty of ammunition, too. So uh, he sends these letters to the media. And he says, my wife was not involved in the kidnapping. She had nothing to do with it. If you agree to retry her and have her acquitted and release her, because he knew she'd have to be retried because it was a court that had now sent her to. He said, then I will hand myself over to the police. 
So the government said, we don't negotiate with terrorists. No negotiations. We'll keep hunting you until we find you. So he realized he's got to now do something else to, to get his way, to get his wife free. He had two sons. He wanted his wife to go back to his sons um, and, and uh, look after them. And then he was prepared to hand himself over. So he said, um, of course, he could have just decided to shoot himself uh, like at least one of the others did. And, uh, but, but, but anyway, this is what he said. He wants to, first of all, make sure his wife gets out of prison. So he realized the only way he's going to get the authorities to do something about it is he's got to take hostages and force their arm. But it won't help to take Chinese hostages because he thought he felt, and probably not without good cause, he felt that if he takes Chinese people hostage, the police will just run in, rush in there and shoot everybody. And But if he takes foreigners hostage, then they'll be a bit hesitant to do the same. So he goes to uh, to Paito, which is where we lived, um, a section called Cherry Hill, a lot of foreigners living there. He knew there were a lot of foreigners living there. And he scouted the area out, you know, wearing his visor on his helmet uh, and on a scooter and so on. He scouted out the area and he saw this house where there was a young American couple living. It was the house right next door to us. And, and and this is the house that he decided he's going to take. Those Americans, he's going to take them hostage and he's going to force the government's hand. Uh, if they don't, then he'll shoot the Americans and he'll shoot himself. And uh, he selected a particular night and that night he went and he broke into the house to try to take them hostage. And as luck would have it, they were, I don't know where, I think back in America at that stage. There was nobody in the house. So the people that he wanted to, to kidnap were not there, were to take hostage. So he left the house and he went back out into the street. And he was standing in the street in the dark. It was already dark at the stage, just about seven o'clock or so. I'd been working late at the office because... I had I had to I had six weeks left in which to close down my office. I had a lot of work to do. I had to pack up a lot of stuff. Uh, 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 most of the stuff, secondhand stuff, I'd have to take back. And you know, the people in the DFR didn't want the stuff, and and I didn't want all of the stuff. So I had to you know find ways, and I had all sorts of things that I had to sort out. And I had to arrange visits to all the people to say farewell and sorry I'm going, and nice to have known you, and so on. You know, just courtesy visits to all the various people before I closed down my office, and it was scheduled to be closed down on the 31st of December. Now, this was the 19th of November, so we had about six weeks to go. And um, I was late coming home, and Anne said to me, don't be too late, because remember, we, we'd bought some, some Pakistani carpets, very nice carpets to take home with us, but we'd found one of them was, was uh, you know, was unraveling, wasn't so good. So we'd arranged with the Pakistani carpet salesman to, to come and bring others to us for us to have a look at so we could choose a different carpet that evening and he was going to come to our house so we don't have to go out to him. And she said, the, you know, the carpet salesman's coming this evening, so don't, don't, don't be late too late. So I thought, you know, if I can get home by about seven or so, I think this guy was due to come at about up or seven or so, uh, then, then, then we can, uh, then it won't be too bad. So Chen is standing outside our house now in the dark, wondering what to do. And I come driving down the road. I didn't even see him. I didn't notice him. I mean, there people out in the street. You don't even notice them. So, And uh, I, my garage was on the street level, and it had a remote. It was operated by a remote. So I open the garage by the remote, and I drive in. And he sees, as I drive in, he sees my registration number. And it had a diplomatic registration number. So he knew immediately, foreigners, I can go there instead. I closed the garage door and I went upstairs. My daughter, Christine, 12 years old, she was busy practicing on the piano. She'd been taking piano lessons at the American school. She was busy practicing on the piano. So I greeted her, gave her a kiss, and I carried my briefcase and stuff up the stairs, up onto the landing, the uh, mezzanine floor where the balcony overlooks the lounge. She was playing the piano down in the lounge. And up in that area, we had our TV and our computer and so on. And, Melanie was sitting there with a little baby boy watching TV. 
and Anne was sitting on the computer, you know, sending emails to people and, and, and so on. So I got up there and kissed them all hello, and I put my briefcase down, and I took little Zachary and put him on my lap and started playing with him. And um, I, I was, um, I hadn't, just a few minutes I'd been there, and I heard Christine stop playing the piano. I didn't think anything of it, or maybe she's finished her practice now, you know, so... Um, and I carried on chatting to Anne and to Melanie and dancing the baby on my knee. And, and the next minute I hear Christine coming up the stairs. And as she comes up, I see there's somebody with her. And I thought, well, you know, she's got a number of friends that she played with in the neighborhood. Yeah, so one of them has probably come in. And I didn't hear them ring the bell or anything, but, you know, she's, one more, must be one of her friends coming up with her. And then I looked again and I saw it's a man that, uh, bringing her up or coming up just behind her and as they came up from the stairs onto the landing and he came into the light i saw he had a nine millimeter beretta with a hammer cocked pointed at her head yeah i went cold then and you know it's the same pistol that was my service pistol back in south africa and um I looked at him and I said, what do you want? And he ignored me, walked into the middle of the room and he looked around, made sure that there was nobody else around. And um, with the pistol I held, held against her head, um, he pushed her to one side and pulled out of his, he had just like uh, uh, these jackets that fly fishermen wear and photographers sometimes wear them with lots of pockets. And he pulled out some um, uh, cable ties. And um, he said to me, indicated I'm a stand up. Now, what had happened is while Christine was busy playing there, he'd come up where our swimming pool was, and there was a window right entering into a laundry, just to a laundry from where the swimming pool was. There was no space around it for garden or anything. And just a little swimming pool fitted in. And right in the front, we had a tiny stretch, tiny little patch of lawn in front of our front front yard, our front door. Um, he walked along next to the, the landing, next to the, the swimming pool, come to the window. The window was unlocked. He slid it open and climbed in, into the laundry. And he'd come along the laundry. And Christine didn't even hear him come in. But she suddenly saw movement while she was playing, and she turned around and she looked, and this guy was standing there pointing a pistol at her, and he indicated to her that she she mustn't say anything. So uh, she was terrified, you know, and um, he then made her turn around and he made her walk up the stairs with a pistol against against her head, and as she came onto the the landing. Um, with this pistol being held against her head, she, her eyes turned towards me and she said, Dad, he's one of them. Now, she'd been seeing these posters on her way home from, I mean, she took the school bus, she used to walk a, uh, about a block away from us. There was a corner with a little shop on it and, and, and that's, that's where she got on the bus and where the bus dropped her in the afternoons when it brought her back. And... Um, on this corner, the lamp posts, and next on the shop windows, they had these wanted posters. So she'd um, she'd um, she'd been able to to see the photos, and and she knew what these guys looked like, and she recognised Chen as soon as he was pointing the pistol at her. She knew who he was. So he made me stand up, and he indicated turn around, and now he's. He's, he's got the cable tie, but uh, he indicated, and I was turn around and put my hands behind my back. But he's got the pistol held against Christine's head. So I knew that once I'm tied up, there's nothing I can do. If I'm going to do anything, I've got to do it now, right now. This is the only chance that I've got in which I'm going to be able to do something. But he's standing there with a pistol cocked and his finger on the trigger and the barrel against my daughter's head. 
So my assessment of the situation was I can do something now. I might be able to disarm him. I might even be able to kill him with his own weapon if I do disarm him. But the slightest move I make now, he's going to press that trigger. And is it worth seeing my daughter's head being blown off and disarming him and then killing him? I'm not prepared to do that. So I turned around and put my hands behind my back and he tied my wrists together. So, you know, I've thought about that quite a lot and I've, I've, I've realized, I mean, I, I, I knew I'd, I'd, the Chileans had trained me, the South Africans had trained me. Uh, I, I, I knew how to disarm a man, but I also knew that in that split second that I move, he can press the trigger and he can blow my daughter's head off. So I just decided that it's not the right thing to do. So I turned around, put my hands behind my back, and he tied my wrists together with the cable ties. And um, then he um, pushed me down onto the chair, and uh, he proceeded to tie Christine up and Melanie. Uh, by then, Anne had taken little Zachary and was holding him, and she had to sit there on the couch where they were all sitting together in a, in a row. And uh, he tied all the ankles together, mine as well, all our ankles were tied. And uh, when he tied the ankles together, uh, he then wanted to tie Anne's wrists. And she looked at him and she said, no. And she held the baby. She said, I've got to look after the baby. You can't tie my... And he looked at her and he looked at the baby. And then he nodded his head and he didn't tie her hands. So just her feet were tied together. So he then decided that he's now going to, uh, uh, to start <clears throat> making phone calls. So he, he, he takes the telephone and he, he phones the police. And he says to them, I'm at this place, and he gives the address. He says, I've taken this family hostage. He didn't know who we were. He didn't even understand what a, a diplomat was or, or anything else. But um, he says, I've taken this family hostage. Um, unless you publish, if, unless I see you, the writing on television, that you are going to um, retry my wife so that she can be acquitted, I'm going to kill these people. And then I'll just kill myself. He said, but I'm going to kill them first. So you can decide. Police didn't believe him. They thought he, they'd had so many false telephone calls and nonsense that, you know, he, he, he started getting quite angry. And uh, then he turned to us and he said, he held the telephone and he said, because um, now we had a, a language problem because he, his home language was Taiwanese, which we had no concept of at all. But he also spoke Mandarin. Uh, but our Mandarin was, you know, very, very limited. And his English was virtually non-existent. So he, he said to, to us, okay, um, held the tele telephone out, and he said, CNN, worldwide, worldwide, CNN. <laughs> and that's what he, and, and, and that's what he wanted. So um, where, where do you get the number? Now he wants us to phone uh, CNN and tell them that we're being held hostage. How do you get the number for CNN? So, and... And said to Melanie, Melanie Michael, that was her. She she'd found a boyfriend in in Taiwan. He was an American, uh, and he 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 was uh, doing a he was doing his master's degree in journalism, and he was doing a a, um, a, a sort of a, a, a an internship with an English language newspaper in Taiwan. 
and uh, he was staying with his uh, sister and uh, or his aunt and and uh, and her, her family and uh, they they uh, they were he, his, his aunt was married to a guy who was working in taiwan so he was living with them staying with them while he was there and doing this i think he was doing about a six month internship as part of his course and melanie had met him through them and uh, they'd started seeing each other so uh, and said, well, you know, he works in the newsroom of, uh, I think it was the China News that he was at, um, uh, phone, phone Michael and tell him. So Melanie with her hands still tied behind her back, uh, now got to try and punch the figures into the telephone because this was, you know, cell phones were in the infancy. There weren't many cell phones around in those days. And, and so she manages to get this thing and he holds the, uh, the, the, the speaker to her, her, her ear and her mouth. And um, she manages to get hold of Michael on the phone and she tells him what's happening. But she, she was getting quite hysterical. She was uh, in, in quite a state at that stage already. And uh, Michael just couldn't believe it. So he got hold of his news editor in the newsroom. And this guy didn't want to believe it either. But there was a guy in the in the newsroom from Agence France Press, and he listened to this and he decided that this is this is genuine. So he got all of his people as well. And next thing is there were media people scrambling around all over. But before they reached it, reached the the uh, the, the, the 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 house, the corporate salesman had arrived. <laughs> and he presses the bell at the at the front gate uh, where the stairs are that lead up to our front door. And the buzzer starts going off for the intercom. And uh, so Chen picks it up and he holds it to my ear you know, so that I can speak. So the guy says, "We, you know, we're here for the carpets. We want to... So I said to him, look, you won't be able to to sell any carpets tonight. I said, we've been taken hostage by Chen Chen Shing. You must please get hold of the police. Tell them what is happening. Tell them they've got to believe this man. And this guy, he listened for a few minutes. He said, oh my goodness. And, and then he was disappeared. And uh, and he did. He did get hold of the police as well and tell them that it was happening. So it, it wasn't very long before... We had, as I subsequently found out, uh, about 400 police surrounding our house. And of course, our house was part of a complex a row of houses, so they were surrounding the whole neighborhood, really. And it wasn't long before an even greater number of media were there, television crews, uh, news reporters, um, radio reporters, you know, newspaper report, uh, every conceivable type. There were just dozens and dozens of them congregating around our house. Everybody wanted to see Chen Chen Shin Shing being shot by the police uh, because this was the biggest news story that Taiwan had had in, in, in years, you know, all the time, all these years, it had just been the conflict between the mainland and, and, and Taiwan. Now suddenly they had this big story about this, these terrible uh, murderers and criminals and, and, and now the leader of the gang has been cornered in this house and he's taken people hostage and, and then the story got out that he's actually taken diplomats hostage and not only had he taken diplomats hostage he's taken south african diplomats and they are taiwan was at that stage at a very sensitive stage of the negotiations between uh, south africa and taiwan on what sort of situation is going to uh, exist in Taiwan after the 31st of December, which is six weeks ago away. How, how close are we going to have relations until then? So it was a very sensitive thing. And the government was very concerned about, about getting the best possible deal. Um, so, you know, uh, Chen Chen Xing had a, uh, he had a bit of an ice in the, up his sleeve with the, uh, his fortuitous choice of uh, hostages. Uh, and he didn't even fully realize it at that stage. So the the, um, the 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 process went on for a, a, 
a little while longer. And then a phone call came through. But in the meantime, I'd been saying to my family, listen, um, the police are, are, are going to launch an assault. I can see this is coming. And there's going to be shooting. He said, if, the, if shooting starts, just, just lie flat on the ground and don't move. Stay as flat as you possibly can on the ground. And now Anne's holding the little baby. And all of us are tied up with our hands behind our backs and our ankles tied together. And he tied them quite tightly. I could feel that I was losing, you know, feeling in my, my hands from the, 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 the tightness of those things. And um, at, at, uh, at one point, uh, I, I said to them, we need to start praying. And so we prayed as a family. We prayed out loud. Um, and next thing is, the phone rings again, and when Chen picks it up, uh, it's one of the deacons from the church who was phoning me the following night. We were having a meeting at the church, and he wanted to phone me to tell me that the meeting had been postponed to another night. And, so, and, and when Chen Chunqing heard that it was somebody speaking English on the other side, he holds, uh, sends the, gives me the phone or holds it to my ear. Now, uh, this all sounds surprising, but the fact is he wanted as many people as possible to know about this. He wanted the public to know that he had, the, because that restricted what the police could do, because they were, were in the public uh, arena uh, as much, and, and he was playing it very, very cleverly. So uh, he was quite happy for me to tell anybody I wanted to, because he, he had, in the meantime, built up barricades. After he tied us up, he, built, he barricaded the stairs. We had stairs going down that he'd come up from the, the garage and the, the kitchen and down, dining room and lounge down below. And there were stairs going up from the landing, going up to the uh, bedrooms. And the houses were all close together. So the police would be able to go up into one house and from there put a bridge across to our roof and then enter from the, the top and come down. So he barricaded both the stairs leading up towards him and the stairs coming down towards him. He barricaded them with furniture and so on and made it very difficult for anyone to get over. And of course, the stairs had sharp turns in them. So uh, you'd only realize as you come around the corner that, there's a, that they've been barricaded. Um, so it was, it was a, a, a difficult situation for the police at this stage. And, and he'd, he'd locked all the doors and made sure everything was closed. And uh, um, uh, he put off all the lights in the house. And uh, um, so everything was in darkness and nobody could see anything going on inside. <coughs> <coughs> so he, um, he, he now has to, um, has to try and persuade the police to... To negotiate with him, but the police, and one has to understand that the the Taiwanese uh, law enforcement situation. I don't know if it's still like that, but at that stage they worked on a bounty system. If a man was wanted, they'd place a price on his head, and the policeman who captured him or killed him, if it was a very serious crime, who actually killed him, would be paid that bounty, and it was a substantial amount of money. And in Chen's case, they'd said that whoever manages to capture or kill this guy will get a two-grade promotion and a cash amount of, uh, I can't remember what it was, but it was a substantial number of Taiwanese, new Taiwanese dollars that he would get. Uh, so every policeman wanted to be the one who gets, gets that bounty and wanted to be the one who, who actually takes Chen Chen-Shing out. And now they've got policemen all around this house, and every one of them wants to be the one who wants. So now they want to try and goad him into doing something that will enable them to, 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 to kill him. They weren't interested in the hostages at all. So um, they keep phoning him on the intercom, and he answers the intercom, and the policeman, and then the policeman starts swearing at him and calling him names and cursing him and getting him really worked up and getting him really angry. And, uh, and, and then he would bang down the, uh, the, the receiver on the, the, the intercom set. And then they'd phone again and he'd pick it up and they'd start this whole business again. And he'd start yelling and shouting at them and he'd bang. And eventually he got so angry that he grabbed the, the, the whole uh, intercom set and ripped it out of the wall and flung it down on the ground. And by now you can see this guy's quite enraged. 
uh, because the police are not, they're not playing the game. They're not doing what he wants them to do. And uh, the, the, the whole thing is now becoming, uh, you know, it's on a bit of a knife edge. You can see that this guy's getting angry and he's going to do something completely irrational soon. And eventually they, and they, they stand outside now and they start yelling at him from outside and taunting him and saying, why don't you come out here? Come on, we'll, we'll show you what a, what a real man is. And, you know, it, it, was, it was really getting out of hand. And I could just see that we were, we were leading, in, leading up to something really bad now. And the next thing, next thing is he grabs Melanie, my 22-year-old daughter, and he put, holds her in front of him like a shield, and he leans over the balcony. And... and um, these guys carry on, and they, in, in in front you could you could see the shadows from the street lights uh, as these guys were moving across in front uh, in front of the house. You could see the shadows on the curtains uh, of the we had huge height curtains in the lounge, uh, big windows, and you could see the shadows on these curtains that he'd drawn all the curtains, and and he was he was he was getting absolutely fed up, and the next minute is he lost it and he fired a shot through the window at the at the police. Man, the police had, had, had AR-15 rifles and automatic assault rifles and, and pistols and, and submachine guns. The next minute, it sounded as if all hell had broken loose. They all opened up. There were bullets flying everywhere, all over the place. And this guy went crazy and he pulled Melanie in front of him and he starts firing back at them. You see, So now we've got a raging gun battle going on over here. And uh, the the uh, the next thing is he pulls out a second gun, and it was a, a Glock. But he's got a thirty-two round magazine. He had two two of those thirty-two round magazines. He jams it into the Glock, and now the Glock can fire on automatic. And he the, the police are are now firing at the door to try and to try and break down the door so they can get in through the door. And, and now he opens up with, his, with a Glock. He fires at the door, fires a bit. <laughs> and the whole front door is battered with, with bullet holes. And, of course, then the police back off now. But, of course, they, you know, it's low velocity. It's nine millimeter bullets that are being fired. So they don't. And, and it was a thick door with, you know, metal on it. And, and so they don't they penetrate the first part, but they don't go through the rest. But then firing from outside, they're firing with, uh, with, with high-velocity assault rifles, and, and those rounds are going through. Uh, and they're coming in, in, into us, and they, the windows are all shattered. And, and downstairs, the, the, we had a huge chandelier in our lounge, and you could see it from where we were on the, on the landing, where the, 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 the balcony was, the internal balcony. And that's the, 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 all the, the glass from the chandeliers were shattered. And I had a, a, a whole tray of uh, a, 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 a bench full of of CDs that I'd bought. You know, there were some very good CDs I'd got in Taiwan, and I had a whole collection of CDs. A bullets going through this lot, my CDs being shattered, and and pictures on the wall being shot down, and it 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 was absolute chaos inside there. What was going on? So I'm yelling at my uh, my uh, family to just lie flat and to take take cover. Of course, there were at least three occasions. The, you know, the, the, the shooting would subside and then it would start again. And then it would subside and it would start again. And this guy, had he had, his pockets were bulging. He had, he had stacks of ammunition and he had a third pistol, which I didn't even see. I only saw and saw it at a later stage after I was no longer there. But, but, but he had a third pistol. So he, 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 was, he was well armed and well prepared for this, this, this whole thing. And um, Anna's is lying in the one corner with, uh, with the little baby. And uh, one, of, one of the bullets hits the, the wall above her, flattens, you know, and, and, and falls down on her head. We've still got that flattened piece of lead somewhere that, you know, Anne's lying, covering the baby, and the bullet lands on her head as, as it's spent. And um, so now I, I'm praying out loud. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm yelling at the police not, not to come in here, but they don't understand why I'm staying. They can't speak English. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they, they, there's just this gunfight going on. And I'm yelling at them and I'm praying and I'm praying out loud. And eventually I, 
I, I couldn't think of anything more to pray. And and I started praying in tongues. And 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 uh um my daughter Melanie was joining me because the family were all praying, and then Melanie was praying in tongues as well. And and uh, and and we were and and you know eventually I I reached the point where I I felt I I don't know what to pray anymore. You know I I don't know what to do. I mean you know I kept yelling at him, leave my daughter alone, take me, take me as the as the as the shield because he's using her as a human shield, and she was getting hysterical because there are bullets flying around all over her, and when he's firing, firing this way and firing that way. Uh, the bullets are being ejected. The empty cartridges are being ejected from the from the gun. He's got two guns now. He's holding her, but he's got and she's tied up, and he's got a, a gun in each hand. And the 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 empty cartridge cases that have been ejected are hitting her in the face. Uh, and you know, I mean, what do you, what do you do in a situation like that? And I keep saying to him, "Leave her. Take me. Take me." And and he does it because, of course, the Chinese are not big people. And and I'm a big person in their uh, in their view. <clears throat> he didn't want to take a big guy. He wanted my daughter. She was a light, uh, slim person, uh, easy to move around. That's what he, he wanted. So I was I was really concerned. Now I mean, there's this absolute indiscriminate firing that's going on. Um, and then it 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 it, it dies down, and then. <laughs> He yells at uh, at uh, at Christine, who's who's only twelve, and he points to the bottom of the stairs that are leading up to the top. Because he's he's now in, uh, sitting on the on the couch and near the edge of the parapet, and he's looking straight at the stairs that are coming up from down. But he can't keep an eye on the stairs that are coming from the top. So he yells at Christine that she must move across there and. Uh, and warn him if there's somebody coming down the stairs. So Christine looks at me, you know, and 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 I said, Christine, do as he tells you. And she says, looks at me, she says, but dad, he's the bad guy. <laughs> so I said, to, I said to her, Christine, don't give me any lip, just do as I say, get over there and do as he says, <laughs> because he's going to shoot somebody. Um, so she scrambles across as best she can and gets to the corner there and, and uh, where the stairs are and, and watches this. And and the next minute um, he uh, <laughs> another round of shooting breaks out. And um, the he he starts firing at the stairs. Um, no, no, I'm getting it wrong now. This is before before this happened. Um, we're praying, and 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 I don't I don't know what to pray anymore, and the shooting is going on. This was, a, I think, the third time that the shooting had started. So, um, I, I uh, 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 and 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 he he just before the third time, he for some reason, he decided he's he's now going to leave Melanie, and he he hurls her down on the ground, and he grabs me. I think he just thought that I'd give him more protection because I'm bigger than what, what she was. So she's lying on the ground now, still tied up, and tries to half crawl under a little table, a little coffee table in the corner here. And and now he pushes me down on the on the the, the couch, and I, I'm sitting on the couch with him next to me, with a one pistol against my head, and the other other pistol pointed down at the uh, at the stairs in case the police come in now because they they're going to, you you just know they're going to to come in at any stage. And uh, and 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 I'm sitting now, tied up, trussed up like a chicken here, with him right next to me. And uh, he 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 he's now watching like this, you see. And at this stage, I hear our garage door downstairs. I hear it opening. So the police have now managed to open the garage door. So now I know they've penetrated the house. The assault's going to take place. So I yell out loud in English. I say, I know you people are down there. Don't come upstairs. Don't carry out an assault now. He's going to kill all of us. Don't do anything now. I can hear movement down below. I don't know whether he heard it or not, but he's now holding me as the shield, and he's waiting for somebody to come up those stairs. And there's a 
twist in the stairs, and then there's the, the barricade. And Christine is now on the far side above those, those stairs over there, at the bottom of those stairs. But she's terrified now, you see. And this, this guy, the, the police then launch their assault. They, we hear them coming up the stairs, boom, 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 as they start running up the stairs. And they've got bulletproof face masks on. They've got body armor. They've got shields. And it's a narrow space. They can't really move much inside there. And they've got their, their, their pistols as they come around the corner. And they come around the corner and they run right into this barricade and they can't get past that. And, and as they come around uh, and to, to get past that, the um, uh, uh, um, chin opens fire on them. But he's, he's now got the pistol against my head and he's firing down at the guys as they're coming up the stairs. And uh, apparently he didn't manage to, to hit any of them. He must have hit their shields and their face masks and their body armor and all the rest of it. But they come on, in the darkness, I can see the, the guys milling around and they can't get past the barricade. And, uh, he's, um, and he's firing away at them. And eventually they're forced to fall back because they, 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 they can't do anything else and go around the corner. And, 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 and as he's, fire, he's firing at them, he turns around and he, he, just to make sure, he fires a couple of shots at the stairs coming down. He didn't know whether there was anyone coming down. There wasn't anybody, but he fires. And Christine is lying there and she sees him turn around and the pistol point towards her. <laughs> and and he, she sees the flash. Um, much later, when Anna's lying there and Anne's trying to get to sleep with the kids and so on in, in this corner, she says, the floor is all wet over here. She says, what, 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 what is this? And Christine looks at her and she says, when he was shooting at me, I wet myself. <laughs> so, so anyway, but now he's, 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 got, he's firing at these guys and he wants to bring more, more fire to bear to get them to, to retreat. So he pulls the pistol that he's had against my head, he pulls it away. And as he brings it across to shoot at them, he fires a shot too soon. And the shot goes through my left knee, right through my knee. And my daughter's lying down on the ground floor in front of me, uh, sort of off to one side. And that same bullet goes through my knee, into her wrist, on her back, through her wrist, and into, into, her, uh, uh, into her back, just misses her spine. And um, she, uh, she screams. And I yell because of, of the, uh, the bullet shot through my, because it, it felt like my knee was, you know, exploding. Um, and I can't do anything because, you know, my hands are behind my back and my ankles are tied together. And, and um, they just they uh, uh, um, retreated now. That was the last firefight. Now, just, just before that firefight took place in the previous one, when I, I, I no longer knew what to pray or what to, I the only thing I could think of was Psalm 23. So I started to recite Psalm 23. And, and you know, when I reached the point where I said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I felt such an emotion coming up inside of me because I realized we're in the shadow of death now. There's all the shooting going on around us. I'm, I'm likely to see my family shot to death in front of me now. Or they're likely to see me shot to death in front of them. Or we're we're all likely to die. You know, this is this is crazy. These police are not interested in in what happens to us. Uh, they're prepared to shoot us to death so they can get this guy. Uh, and and when I I said those words, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it it had such an emotional impact on me. I I just felt the emotion welling up inside of me. Um, but then, strangely, the shooting subsided and it stopped. And then it was all quiet until they launched the assault and they came up those stairs. Then it went wild again. Then the shooting was going crazy. And that's when Christine thought he was trying to shoot her. Uh, he was, wasn't trying to shoot her. He was just firing shots up at the stairs to deter anybody who might be coming down. <coughs> but she just saw the <coughs> pistol swing towards her and the flash as the firing started. And with the other pistol, he swings it around and he starts firing and the bullet goes through my leg and into my daughter. So there's there's chaos, and and now the police are, have retreated. They 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 went right out of the house again, um, and and 
Melanie screaming and I'm moaning and, and, and I yelled at her. I said, Melanie, are you all right? And she says, I've been shot. And I said to her, where? She said, in my back. And I thought of her spine. And I said, whatever you do, don't move. Just, she said, but it hurts so. I said, just don't move, don't move. Because I didn't want her to damage her spine anymore if her, the spine had been hit. And, and then Anne, um, I, I, feel, I feel that my, I, I try to move my leg to see if it's okay. And I, and I feel that my leg is sliding around. Uh, and then I realized that it's, it's wet down below. And then I realized that that's the blood from my leg that has run down my leg onto the floor. And that's what my leg, my foot is sliding around on. <laughs> and I'd just been reading a book on the Vietnam War. And they had described somebody who had been shot and was bleeding. And he was talking to everyone and he was fine. And the next minute he was dead. And I remembered Leon von Weyck, my company second in command, who had tried to break into that house when the insurgent was inside it and had been shot with the AK-47. And he'd been the same. He'd been in the ambulance talking to the guys. And he was, he was okay. He was talking to them quite lucid. And the next minute he was dead. And, and I thought to myself, I, I could die any time now. So... As, as I was realized that, you know, I didn't know how bad this was. I just knew that I'm, I'm losing a lot of blood. And, 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 and I was already starting to feel a little bit faint. And, you know, I don't know whether it was the pressure or everything that was going on or the amount of blood I was losing or what it was. But I, I, I shouted out to the rest of the family. I said, I said, Anne, I think I might be going. I said, whatever happens, just trust in Jesus. Keep praying and trust in Jesus. And I was hoping if I, if I said, I think I might be going, that uh, Christine wouldn't understand what I'm saying. She knew immediately what I was saying. And she came crawling across from where she'd been lying down. Um, and and, and she'd, he'd, he'd actually loosened her, her wrists at that stage. At one stage, Anne asked if she could, could loosen, untie her wrists. So he, he, she'd, yeah, her feet were still tied together, but her wrists were loose. And, and she came crawling across to me and she grabbed my leg. Um, fortunately, not the one that was uh, bleeding, but the, but the other one. And she held and she said, Daddy, don't die. Don't die, Daddy. And, you know, and I kept feeling as if, as if I'm going to pass out. And um, the next minute, there's a uh, yelling between this guy and the police. And I hear an exchange. Now, I can't. They were talking Taiwanese and I couldn't follow any of what, uh, what they were saying. And what I heard later was he said, um, some of these people have been shot, send a doctor up. Now, there was no doctor down there. They didn't have anybody like that there. And uh, so, you know, now the guy who's speaking to him uh, answers. And, and the next minute, I hear somebody running up the stairs. Somebody come, entered the house, jumped through one of the broken windows and came running up the stairs. Now, I don't know what it is, but Chen Chen Singh is standing there with two pistols like this. And this guy in the dock, I can just see this guy in a police uniform come running in and he runs and he, he holds his hands up like this. And, and, and uh, um, in the meantime, um, when, when I'd, I'd said to Anne, I, I, I think I'm going because I said, you know, the, I'm losing a lot of blood. She came, she left the baby and she came crawling across the floor to where I was. She wasn't going to stand up because the shooting could start again at any minute. And she said, where? And I said, my, my left leg. And I said, you've got to stop the bleeding. And she said, with what? And she sort of looked around and, 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 and then she looked up at me and I still had my tie on that I'd been wearing, because I wore civilian clothes to the office every day. There's only two actual functions and things that I would wear, my uniform. Um, she looked up and she saw the, the, the tie. It was my school old boy's tie that I was wearing that day. And she said, your tie. And she quickly untied my tie from around my neck. And she tied a tourniquet around my knee, around above my knee. And, 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 and that stopped the bleeding. You know, she tied it quite tight. Um, and the next minute is this, this guy comes running up, up the stairs. 
And uh, as he, he comes in, uh, uh, there's a sudden exchange. And this guy with his pistols, holding one pistol pointed at the guy, he, he feels around his body for any arms. And he stops on his belt and he yells something at him. And the guy answers him. I found out afterwards the guy had a, a pager on his belt for paging people. And, uh, and this guy felt that. And the guy said to him, no, that's just my pager. And then he felt and he realized it wasn't a, a weapon. So he left that. And then he turned around and he, he, uh, he pointed to, to me and my, my daughter. And he said, uh, you know, these are the two that have been wounded. So the guy goes down towards Melanie and he says, no, that one's not hurt badly. Leave her there. Uh, take this one, pointing to me. So, uh, but, but the, the, he, this guy knew what this guy was and he didn't want to leave a young, attractive woman in his, with him for any time. He didn't know how badly Melanie was hurt or something, but he wanted to get her out of there. So this guy had agreed to him taking two hostages out. So he, he, he went down to, to, to pick Melanie up, but her wrists were still tied there. So he tried to, 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 to force them apart and, and break the, uh, the, 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 what she was tied with. And uh, he didn't realize that she had a bullet through her hand, through her, at least through her wrist. And he, he managed to actually break the, I don't think she was tied with a cable tie. I think he'd used rope or something or string, but, but he managed to break this and get her uh, arms apart, and, and uh, she screamed from the pain in her hand and her wrist. And um, she turned around and, 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 uh, and held up her hand like this, and she could actually see right through her, the hole right through her wrist. Um, and and uh, so uh, he then picked her up, and he carried her downstairs and, and, uh, and took her out. And uh, handed her through the window to to some of the other guys, and and then he came running back up for me. And uh, he grabbed me, but I was a bit big to carry. And at this stage, I was sort of drifting close to unconsciousness, and he he, he started pulling me, dragging me down the stairs because he jumped over the the barricade, and he dragged me over the barricade. And the next day, we found a whole trail of blood from my leg, leg and the way that he dragged me out. And uh, uh, as he got down to the bottom of the stairs with me, um, and he was dragging me along, I, my, my glasses fell off. And I still remember thinking to myself, how, how am I going to read now without my glasses? <laughs> but, but he got me to the, to the window, and he managed to lift me up high enough for some of the policemen to reach through, and they were all busy with the butts of their pistols breaking the glass out so they could get me out without cutting me. Um, and he, he dra they dragged me out, and then, and then the guy yelled at them from upstairs. He said, he said, no more, you're not coming up here again. You come up here again, I'm going to shoot you. And that guy was incredibly brave. I mean, what he did to come up there and get us out, out of there, he could have been shot quite easily. And I found out afterwards that this guy, who his name was Hoyo Yi, he was the chief of police in that area. And he was the guy who had been placed in charge of the whole Chen Chen Shing investigation. And he had not been notified. He'd been in a different part of Taipei. And the policemen who'd come around were not under his command. Uh, they were all just bounty hunters. They were just looking for, for, for wanting to kill Chen Chen Shing. And, and he was the guy who, who, who had had training in negotiating and, and uh, uh, knew something about, about these things uh, and, and had SWAT teams under his, uh, at his disposal and so on. Um, and and he, uh, he then took charge and, and uh, you know, got the other police, told them to move. They, they hadn't thrown a cordon around the house. Civilians were pushing in all over. They all wanted to see Chen Chen Shing being killed. They had no concept of what the danger was that was involved. And when I got out, they put me onto a, a gurney, you know, one of these stretchers on wheels. And my daughter was there, and I was still surprised that, you know, we 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 were both still there. We hadn't, and and they they couldn't get us to the ambulance because there were too many people. There were me, people from the media crowding, and I was lying on the gurney, and there were guys shoving microphones in my face, saying, uh, "How many people are in the house? What did Mr. Chen say? Uh, uh, what, what what's going on there? Has anybody been killed?" Uh, you know, and, and 
lights shining and flashing from photographs and 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 uh, my my daughter's lying next to just a little short way from me on the gurney and she's screaming from the pain and um and and they can't get the gurney through the crowds and the people are trying to get her to say something and and i i was so angry and and at that stage i was sort of off under the impression the whole thing's over you know he's given up now and we're all going to get out and 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 then through through the sort of mists of of, of semi consciousness, I I realized Anne's still inside there. She's not going to get out, and Christine is still there, and the baby's still there. And and I was I was so angry that I just sort of I, I sort of forced myself to 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 wake up and stop feeling you know relaxed and and this is all over. And and with all these people screaming and shouting around me and and the, the chaos and there's absolutely no control at all and the ambulance men can't get us to the ambulance and 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 and, and I, I I I jumped up and I grabbed some of the people and pulled them aside and I said I want my wife and children out of there get get who who's in charge I get and I thought to myself nobody seems to be in charge I better take charge of this thing <clears throat> and I'd forgotten about my knee by that side time so I jumped off of the, the gurney. You know, to try and get some order into this chaos. <laughs> and as soon as my leg touched the ground, I went over, <laughs> you know, as if I'd been bolexed. Uh, and then I realized you you cannot do anything. And, you know, for the second time that night, I felt the sense of total, complete helplessness. The first was when we'd been tied up and the whole thing started. And I realized I cannot do anything. You know, I, 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 I was in charge of a parachute brigade. I had 7,000 people under my command. If I said something, the people did it. And here I'm sitting. I can't do anything. One man has got control of me and my family. I've lost all control. And that feeling of helplessness was, it was difficult to describe something like that. And uh, the second time was when I, I, I hit the ground after jumping off of that gurney. And I realized I can't do anything. I'm, I'm, I'm useless. Uh, People can't understand me. Uh, nobody knows who I am. What's going? You know, it's just a, a total waste of time. And and they pushed me back onto the gurney, and uh, uh, and and they eventually started finding a bit of space and pushing me through, and getting Melanie through. And they put us each into a separate ambulance, and they drove off with us. And when they drove off, uh, the the reporters were still trying to take photographs through the window of the ambulance and 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 you know the tv cameras running running along next to the ambulance while it tried to make its way through the crowds trying to take pictures of everything they they were like a crowd of vultures man you know coming in hyenas coming in from from or, or wild dogs trying to to eat an animal while it's still alive uh, it it was a it, it was a nightmare situation anyway <clears throat> We uh, we ended up um, both of us in hospital. They took us to the Veterans General Hospital, which I'd visited before, and so visits of my as a military attaché and so on. Now suddenly I'm at a patient on the patient in. Melanie went straight into surgery because the bullet had lodged inside her pelvis uh, area, her pelvic area, and you know they they had to get to remove the bullet and they had to perform surgery on her immediately. Uh, there was nothing surgery could do to me. So they, you know, cleaned up my wound and bandaged it and so on. And, and I was put into a ward and, 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 and there was a TV in the ward so I could follow what, what was going on. Um, a lot of these things I only found out uh, about at, at a later stage when I did some investigation, when I, I, I wrote, tried to write the story of, the, the, of everything that took place. And then it was a night of uncertainty. I'd I'd only been there for about two hours before I was evacuated. That's that's when the you know the gun battle. He'd, he'd only been holding us for about two hours, and I know that because we had a cuckoo clock downstairs, and and you know every hour and half hour the cuckoo would sound off, so I could keep track of the of the time. So it was, you know, it was only a little after nine o'clock at night by the time I was I was taken out. Um, and you know, I'm I'm telling you what I can recall now, but I'm I, I'm also Telling you that there, there are lots of things that were happen, happening that I, that I'm leaving out now that I, you know, I've either forgotten about or that there just isn't time to to detail all the things. But, but during that that night, there were a couple of things that happened. Um, first of all, going back to the house now, Anne is sitting there. She's seen her, her husband and her daughter being carried out, both of them have been shot. Um, 
she doesn't know what's going to happen next. She doesn't know what's happened to her. She doesn't know what situation we're in. I, I was saying to her, she, I think I'm going. Uh, she doesn't know whether I'm still alive. She doesn't know anything. But she's sitting there now. But, you know, Anne's nature is such that she can accept a thing and, and she's very practical and she doesn't, uh, she doesn't let those things that she can't do anything about uh, bother her to the extent that she becomes immobile. Um, so, you know, one of, one of the things Anne, Anne decides now, you know, it's, things are quieted down. And now what I found out later was at this point, the uh, the Taiwanese cabinet had met, and a cabinet decision had been made that no further shooting is to take place, uh, and the police had now been instructed under no circumstances any shooting. Uh, nobody's life must be endangered at all, not even Chen's at this stage, because they worried about us. So all of a sudden things start changing, things quiet down, and there's no more shooting, and it's all got quiet there, and and. and uh, there are exchanges, people shouting backwards and forwards and so on, but but there's nothing much happening. The telephones are still working, and Chen starts talking to people on the telephone. So Anne wants to go to the toilet. But, you know, she's got to go downstairs or upstairs if she wants to go to the toilet. Um, and now she's got to get Chen to uh, to let her go, go to the toilet. Um, so she tries to tell him, but her Mandarin is not so good. Now, uh, you know... Everything depends on, on on the tone you use. And she he, he can't understand what she's saying. And she, she th eventually she says, well, she's not going to give him a demonstration of what, what she wants to do now. <laughs> He's got to, but eventually he manages to figure it out. So so he allows her to go to the toilet, but Christina's got to stay behind and the baby's got to stay behind. And then Anne realizes now, you know, he's busy talking to people on the phone. She's not going to, there's nothing more she can do. It's getting late. Um, she may as well try and get some sleep. So she she manages to say to him, look, I, I want to go to bed. Can I go to bed now? And he looks at her in, in horror and he says, no, you can't go to bed. You're staying right here. So she says, okay, well, can I get some bedding down here so that I can go to sleep on the bed, on the floor? So he says, you can send Christine to get that. So Christine goes upstairs and gets some pillows and some duvets and other things and brings them down and, and settles down with a little one and, and with Christine and so on. Um, now, Chen's busy with her, his conversations and he starts, he, he, he phones TV stations, the, the, the three TV stations. He phones and answers for these TV stations and he talks to them. So the police wanted to now negotiate with him. But they can't get hold of him because he's on the phone to these TV stations. And the TV anchors, they, this is great because this is all being broadcast all over. The, the, the three TV stations in Taiwan stopped all their, all their scheduled programs. And they just focused. They were outside the house photographing what was going on. Everything was just covering this, this hostage gun battle. And uh, now he's talking and he's telling the whole, his whole life story to the TV anchor and telling them how things happened and what uh, went wrong and, and, and so on in his life and why he's doing this and how it's important it is that his wife gets retried. Re and and, and um, then he says, um, I don't, and they ask him about the hostages. He says, I don't understand these people. He says, they keep praying, 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 but I don't know who they're praying to. I don't know, I don't know what this is about. They keep praying all the time. Um, and a little later, while he's talking to them, uh, Christine now can't, can't get to sleep. So her school bag is lying fairly nearby, and she pulls her school bag over, and she opens it up, and she gets some paper out of it and a pen, and she starts drawing uh, a picture there in a sort of semi-darkness. And she draws a heart with a cross in the middle. And in across the cross, she writes, uh, uh, I love you. I love, God. I love God. She loves. I love God. And and then she uh, she writes a little prayer on the top. She writes, "Dear Lord Jesus, please look after Daddy and Melanie, and please let us get out of here safely." And at the bottom, she says, "Lots of love, Mommy and Christine." And this guy is watching her and talking to the TV anchor while while he's watching her. 
And 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 eventually he leans across and he takes a piece of paper from her and he looks at it. And he can't read it as such, but now he 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 describes it to the TV anchor and he says he doesn't know what this is all about. So the TV anchor says to him, you know, after he described the cross and so on, he says, Well, these people are Christians and they are praying to to God as Christians, and they are praying to Jesus. And he says, well, he, he was, you know, he'd been brought up a Buddhist and he, he doesn't mean anything to him. So anyway, <clears throat> the next morning, negotiations start. Now, through all of this, I've been lying in the hospital and people start coming through to me. Chris Dupinar, the Dutch Reformed woman who's a... A lecturer at the uh, at the Taiwan um, the, the, the theological college. Now he he comes through, and uh, and he says to me, Mac, let me help you with with what's going on. And he sat next to my bed the whole time, and he translated everything that was on the TV so that I would know exactly what is happening at any particular stage. And I'm eternally grateful to him for that. So that, that meant that I could keep abreast of what was going on. He sat there right next to me. Um, Anne's doctor, she uh, would see him for asthma and occasional blood pressure problems and so on. And he prescribed medicines to her. He came to see me he, as a doctor. He managed to get access to the ward and come in this. And he said to me, please. And he's got a package there with a whole lot of medication in it. And he says, please. Now, he, he, he was a, a, a Christian Chinese. He's and he's, he's crying as he comes in there. And he says, please, Colonel, please, I've got to get this medicine to your wife. Uh, uh, can't you arrange that they will allow me to go into the house so that I can give her a medicine so that she'll be all right? So I said to him, well, doctor, you know, I appreciate your, your concern, but really there's nothing I can do, you know. Um, and and uh, the... the um, my 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 cousin's son Matthew, my second cousin, he pitches up there, and and he hangs around all the time to sort of and stands in as our family spokesman. And he's he's Taiwanese, he always uh, Mandarin had had reached quite a high level at that stage, so he could he could you know actually speak to the media and and make little statements and so on on our behalf. And I, I was really grateful to him for also helping us out with that as well. Um, and and uh, the the while all this is going on now in, inside the house, uh, the negotiations and just to go through very briefly what happened, the Chen's wife was brought from prison to participate in the negotiations. They felt that if she was there, she could help persuade him to release some of the other hostages and to you know it would be useful in the uh, in the the and and there was a woman there as well who who, who spoke some English. And it was obviously good for her to be there because no one else who was involved in the negotiations could speak English. So this this woman was a useful uh, uh, person to have there at that stage. And there was a, a human rights lawyer called Frank Shear. Now, Frank Shear um, was an opposition politician. But he came in and offered his services as a negotiator. And he was allowed into the house. So they had this woman, she, Chen's wife, and Frank Shea, who came into the house, and, and, and there was all of this the negotiation going on. And while all this is going on, uh, Anne is sitting on her computer because it, he'd now uh, cut her bonds and so on, so she wasn't tied up anymore. Um, but uh, he's sitting there with his three pistols and all his ammunition and his magazines and so on, in front of him and uh, and discussing the negotiations are going on between him and the and the others, and uh, Anne's on the computer sending emails to all the family and friends in South Africa and elsewhere, uh, telling them we're okay. And uh, by then she'd had a chance to actually phone me in the hospital, and uh, she you know she found out what was going on and uh, she'd been so her mind had been set at ease that Melanie had come back from the surgery. They said she was going to be okay, uh, 
but you know she'd been badly hurt and so they, she would be staying in hospital for quite a while um, and so I could put, set Anne's mind at rest about that as well and it was a great relief to me to be able to actually hear her when, when she was over there. And then a, a very bizarre thing happens. Um, this, this woman who speaks English, while the others are busy talking, and the Frank Shear is busy with heavy negotiations with, with uh, Chen Chen Xing. Um, this woman says to Anne, um, you're, uh, you're looking very tired. Um, would it help if I, if I gave you a bit of a massage? And so Anne said, oh, that would be lovely. I'd really appreciate that. And then she says, but wait a minute. Uh, Chen Chen Xing's uh, wife is a trained masseur. She can, she can uh, massage you. So she speaks to Chen Chen Xing's wife. And there, while the negotiations are going on, Chen's wife is busy massaging Anne on, on the floor there to you know, ease the tension in, in her body. So that, that, that was quite bizarre that that sort of thing happened. Um, while I'm in the hospital, I start getting phone calls, lots of phone calls. Um, people, what, what has happened is uh, the, the, the guy, the, the deacon who phoned me uh, to tell me about the meeting, and I, I told him that we're being held hostage, and it's Chen Chen Xing, and this is, this is what's going on. He then immediately got hold of uh, Pastor Bill from the church, and, and uh, all, all the other people in the church were notified. And most of them, as I say, were expatriates, and they all immediately notified their families. And within literally minutes of me having told uh, uh, the the deacon about what was going on, um, he, he the, the the message had gone out to Christian friends all over the world, in Australia, in New Zealand, in the U.S., in in South Africa, in the U.K., in Canada. In, in Italy, in, in, in Czechoslovakia, and all, all sorts of places where there were people, uh, the, the, the message had gone out and Christians were praying. So there was a prayer chain around the world. Uh, and, and, and by the time this prayer chain got going, was around about the time that the shooting came to an end. And, uh, and, and you know, we, 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 Melanie and I were evacuated and, and things calmed down. Um, I got a personal phone call from General George Mayram. Uh, as soon as he heard about it, he tried to find out and where I was, and, and, and then he, you know, he phoned the military, the, the embassy people, and they, they were able to tell him that I was in the hospital, and they gave my, my phone number to him, and he, he phoned me, and, and I appreciated that. That was a, a very good gesture on his part. Um, I, I, uh, I got a, a phone call from the director of... Uh, of foreign relations at the military, this naval commodore. Uh, it was around about the first time I'd heard from him in the whole time I'd been in Taiwan. I mean, he just wasn't interested in Taiwan. I just never heard from him about anything. He got the lower down guys to talk to me. All of a sudden he phoned me and uh, he said, what can we do to help you? And I said, look, the one thing I want you to do is to get hold of my daughter in the Air Force, Shona, our second daughter. Just Tell her what has happened and please keep her informed. He said, that's no problem. We'll all organize that for you immediately. So I said, well, that's, that's all I want you to do for me um, at this stage. And I just want to get my wife out of there. They say, don't you worry about that. You don't worry about anything back in South Africa. We'll, we'll sort it all out. In my innocence, I believed him. And so I, I let that go. I, I stopped worrying about Shona and I stopped worrying about, uh, you know, her what, what she would hear about, because obviously all of this is on the media all around the world. And, and I don't know what they're saying. I don't know what nonsense they're talking. Uh, I do know that they often talk a lot of nonsense. Um, we had lots of close friends who phoned me. I can't even remember all the people who phoned me. I had old school friends who phoned me. I, I had uh, 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 people from the military, who, who friends who, who phoned me and, and you know, well wishes and so on. Uh, all over the place. We had family who got hold of me. Um, during the rest of the day, there were successive releases. There was a whole series of, of negotiations that I won't go into detail with about now. But um, first of all, they let the baby go. 
So the baby was handed through the door, through the window, and it went and, and some of our friends from the, uh, the embassy looked after the little baby. Um, then, then they agreed to let Christine go. Now, now Christine had already, uh, you know, shown a great deal of, uh, of courage uh, because at one stage what Anne wanted to do was she wanted to, Chen was hogging the telephone all the time. So Anne wanted to make some phone calls as well. But she decided, she, she knew I had, a, I had a cell phone in my car. I kept it in my car. It's the only place I used it, you know. It, it was in the early days of cell phone. It was one of these things that looked like a brick, you know. And, and anyway, she, she, uh, uh, she wanted to get the cell phone. So she said to Chen, you know, can we go and fetch the cell phone down in the car? And, uh, and he eventually understood what she was saying. And he said, yes, okay, she can go down. But Christine can go down to fetch it. Anne's got to stay up there with him. <coughs> so Christine goes down. And um, she decides when she gets down there, she gets the cell phone, but she decides she wants to see what's going on outside. So she opens the garage door and she steps out into the street. And immediately there are policemen there with rifles and pistols and things because uh, they expect Jim to come out with her, you see. And they're going to shoot him the moment they see him. So I see Chen's not there, and it's only Christine. And she looks around, she's big eyes at all these guns pointing at her. And, and so one of the guys says, come, come with us, you mustn't go back inside, come to us. And so Christine looks at them and she says, if I don't go back inside, he's going to kill my mom. He said, and you people, all you do is shoot and you don't do anything. You're not getting us out of here. You must do something about getting us out of here. And she turns around, she goes back inside and closes the door, and she goes back upstairs to Anne. So with a... So uh, Anne then had this, the cell phone and she was able to make some calls on that and, and, and sort out a few things. Um, and uh, so sort of midway through the afternoon, they managed to negotiate Christine's release. By then, Christine had fallen asleep. So Anne wakes her up and says, Christine, he's agreed to let you go. You must go. You go, go, go downstairs and they'll help you through the window. So she says, I'm not going until, until you get released. I'm, I'm staying with you. So Anne says to her, no, because Anne knew that, you know, we just got to get as many people away from this man as possible. So she said, no, you go downstairs. I'm go I'll be back. I'll be down soon and I'll be able to join you. So Christine goes down and they take her through the window and the police fetch her outside. And she, and one of the people from the, the embassy, Voter Bardenhorst, collects her and grabs her and gives her a hug and takes her off. And then she was taken to join me up in the hospital. Um, but she was okay. She, was no, she hadn't been injured at all. Um, they, they keep saying they're going to come out now. It's Jenna surrendered. And then a half an hour will go and nothing happens. And I'm getting frantic now because Anna's the only one left. And I don't know whether she's going to be coming out or not. And uh, eventually he, he agrees to this. And so the, the TV cameras are all on our front door and, and there Chin comes out with Ho Yo Yi, the police chief uh, next to him with a, uh, another policeman holding a bag with all his pistols and his ammunition in and Ho Yo Yi is uh, handcuffed and next to him is his wife holding his arm and, uh, and they walk down the steps, and behind them comes Frank Shear, the, the negotiating inside there. Well, what's, what's happened to Anne? Um, I find out later that, that two things happened to Anne. The first is, uh, as they're about to go out, she says, um, just, just a moment, I just want to change into something that looks a little more presentable. That's, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm a bit crumpled and dirty from this. I want to, I want to put on something else. So now everybody's got to wait while she runs upstairs and, and, and makes herself look pretty and combs her hair a bit and, and, and so on. And then she comes down. And, and now they, 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 they start moving out. And the others are all gone out already. And she's, oh, just a minute, you know, we, we, we had two cats in Taiwan. We brought one of them over, both, both of them over from South Africa. And, and they stayed with us over there. And, and she's now concerned about the cats. She says, oh, I don't know when I'm going to be coming back. Let me just go and put out food for the cats. So she goes into the kitchen and she gets food for the cats and sits, and then she comes out. So, and so I'm sitting there in the hospital just about frantic because I don't see any sign. And next thing is Anne comes out. Broad smile on her face. And, and you know, the same smile that, that I fell in love with all those years ago, 25 years before that, 
when I'm uh, when I was in uh, saw her for the first time at the Goodwood Showground. So uh, <laughs> so I I was so relieved when I saw her come out. It was it was just such an incredible an, an incredible thing. And and when she comes outside, my driver Jimmy is is waiting for her. And he, he he's waiting out in the street. He's been waiting in the street the whole time for and until she comes out. He said to me when he came to see me in the hospital, uh, he he said, I, "I go now." So I said, "Where are you going, Jimmy?" He said, "I go to your house." I said, "What are you going to do there?" He says, "I wait for Mrs. to come out." My flow. Uh, my flow. He used to call her my flow. I wait until my flow comes out. Uh, I wait there for all of the people, and he did. He waited there for hours until Anne came out. And and he and he had the packet of medicines that the doctor Doctor Gow had given me, and 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 uh, uh, and 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 when Anne came came out, Jimmy walks up to her and he says, "Well, Flo, here's your medicines." <laughs> and when she got into the ambulance, he got in with her and uh, and had accompanied her back because she had to go to the hospital as well. Everybody had to go to the hospital to be checked up. You see. So uh, what there are, there are two things I want to say about the uh, the, the the actual process there. Um, the one is Anne's role. She was held for a total of twenty six hours by this guy, um, which is perhaps not a lot, but it's a full day, more than a full day. And Anne's role in calming this guy down was vital to the whole process. I have no doubt about that at all. Uh, she never panicked. She never got uh, uh, showed uh, hysteria. Uh, she she always she kept everyone else calm. And and when Chin at, at one point he he said to her when you know I, we'd been evacuated, and she was there with Christine and and, uh, and the baby. And uh, and he, he 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 said to her, things are not working out right. He took the one pistol and he put it under his chin, yeah. And he said to her, he's going to shoot himself. Now, she didn't want to have this guy blowing his brains out in front of her and her, her, her twelve-year-old child. Uh, and she didn't want to see something like that anyway. And you know, as a Christian, she has respect for for human life. So she said to him. She, in, in Mandarin, and she managed to command sufficient Mandarin to say this. She said, don't do it. You have a wife and two children. They need you. Don't do it. And he held a pistol like this for a while, and he looked at her, and then he took the pistol away. And, you know, that's indicative of, of how Anne was during this thing. She, she never got flustered. Uh, she never got panicky, uh, and she had a calming effect on everybody during that that whole thing. So, I I, I learned, and during that experience, I learned to have tremendous respect for my wife's courage, and for her ability to handle a crisis. Um, she she was just just amazing, and and you know she just sorted out things. Then the other thing I want to say is the bullet that wounded me and and uh, Melanie. In many ways, that was a miracle bullet. Because I, I asked often, I asked myself and I asked the Lord, why, why did we have to be shot? Why did that have to happen? Um, it, it truly was a miracle bullet because I had reached a stage where I was losing patience. I'm not the most patient person in the world. And I was losing patience with the police, with this man, with the whole situation. Nothing was going right. And I was reaching a stage where I, I would probably have eventually decided I'm going to headbutt this guy in the guts and knock his pistols out of his hand. And, and you know, that, that, that's how I'm, I'm going I'm to sort this thing out. But I'm, I'm tied up with my hands behind my back and my, and my ankles tied together. What am I going to accomplish to doing something like that? He would have, he would have shot me. He would have just shot me because once I've, I'd head butted him, I wouldn't have been able to do anything else. And, and then he would have got his pistol back and he would have put a bullet through my head. <clears throat> I really had to be moved, removed from the situation. I was, I, was not, uh, I was not the right person to be there for a lengthy period of time because I was going to do something foolish. I, I, was, I was no longer prepared to accept that nothing was happening. We weren't being, the situation wasn't being resolved. 
And Melanie is, and at that stage was a 22 year old, very, uh, very attractive young woman, um, slender and, and, and uh, very appealing. And, and uh, this guy was guilty of, of, of rapes and of murder. She wasn't the person that, was, that should have stayed behind there. She needed to be got out of there before, because once things had calmed down, who knows what he would have done. She needed to be got out of there. And, and that, that would have got us both out of there. And we were the people who needed to get out. The person who stayed behind was Anne. And Anne, Anne was the right person to stay behind, because her temperament was such that she could handle that. Um, so it, that's why I regarded it as a miracle bullet. Uh, nobody wants to be shot, and nobody wants to go through that. Um, but the fact is, the bullet went in one side of my knee and came out the other side. And and the other side where it came out, there was quite a nasty gaping hole of broken flesh and so on. <coughs> when they x-rayed me, the doctor said they don't understand what happened. Because... If the bullet had gone straight through my knee, it would have gone through bone and shattered the bone. But they said there, there, there's, there's, there's no damage to the bone. In fact, there was. There were a few little slivers under my, under my kneecap. And I had to have an arthroscopy about, about six months later where they had to scrape the kneecap to, to get rid of those. But, but that bullet should have, should have shattered my knee. Uh, and if it had done that, it wouldn't have continued into, into Melanie at all. It would have uh, just lodged somewhere in my knee, probably, and, and maybe left me crippled for life. So I said to them, well, maybe it was deflected slightly and it went behind the knee and came out the other side. The doctor said if it did that, it would have had to do a path like this to go out. They said, and that doesn't seem logical. And they said, and it also, if it went behind your knee, it would have severed some of your nerves. And you'd probably have lost the use of your leg completely. So, uh, uh, you know, um, they regarded that as a miracle bullet from that point of view. In Melanie's case, it missed her spine by centimeters. And it traveled about 15 centimeters inside her pelvic area without touching any of her vital organs or her reproductive organs. And it came to rest between two arteries which uh, a, a fraction in either direction, and it would have severed one of those arteries, and she would have bled to death within a few minutes. Um, within a few minutes, she would, have, she would have bled to death. So in so many ways, that was a miracle bullet, and they managed to get it out without, without major further injury to her. I also have to talk about the, the, the support we received from this, the embassy staff, especially Voter Bardenos, the commercial attaché, and his wife, uh, Marisha. They went to great lengths to help us, and they were the ones who looked after our house while we were in hospital and, and our cats and, and, and uh, sort of looked after Christine for a while and, and the little baby and, 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 and all of that sort of things. They, they, they were the ones who, who were amazing when, uh, when that whole thing took place. And also amazing were the, uh, the, the, the armed forces of, of Taiwan. They, it was as though they felt guilty, as, as if they felt that it was their fault. And it really wasn't. I mean, they, there was nothing they could have done to prevent that, that from happening. Uh, but they, uh, they, they, they did everything they possibly could to, um, to help us. Uh, they replaced our whole front door and they replaced all our windows and, and <laughs> everything in the house. You know, they, they fixed up everything and, and they didn't charge us anything for that. Um, the the uh, uh, um, our friends from the church uh, the, we, and and from the United Marriage Encounter, an organisation that we'd had something to do with, that were focused on enriching marriage experience and so on. Uh, um, it was the American Thanksgiving at that time, and our friends from the church came across and they held a Thanksgiving dinner at the in in the the wards there for us while we were in hospital. 
they, they <laughs> kept us in hospital for, for quite a while, probably longer than what they, they, they needed to, but they just wanted to be absolutely sure. There was nothing wrong with Anne or with Christine, but they also kept them there for a few days, um, a day or two, not, not too long. So um, <clears throat> then the, we, were, we were in the hospital and the media were still trying to get to us. They did everything in their power. to try. They, they impersonated doctors and dressed like nurses and tried everything to try and get in there with us. Um, there, there was a, a Christian friend that we had, a missionary who had been in Taiwan for more than 20 years, uh, in our funder's uh, She was a trained nurse. And she knew that in Taiwan, hospitalization is very different to South Africa. The nurses only do the clinical side. They don't make your bed. Uh, they don't wash you. The hospital doesn't feed you. Your family have got to do all that. The family must bring you food. The family must make your bed. Uh, somebody else must come down and do all of those things. The nurses don't do that. They only do concerned with the clinical side of it. And Enough Under Scape knew that. <clears throat> so she came and moved in, into the hospital. And, and she stayed there and she did everything for us in the hospital. A wonderful woman. She uh, was a, a Baptist missionary to Taiwan. And uh, she's retired a long time ago now. She lives, she's back in South Africa. But, but what a wonderful person. She spoke Chinese fluently. She understood the whole system. She understood how their hospitals worked. Uh, she knew what she could say to the matrons and to the, to the uh, doctors and, and, and all the rest of it. So it was wonderful having her there. Then I want to say something about a, a, a memorial service I attended. Uh, I had agreed before this all happened, before the hostage taking, uh, to attend the, um, the memorial service at the Kinkaseki, where the Kinkaseki uh, um, Japanese prisoner of war camp had been. They had three survivors from that uh, camp who were going to attend the service. And uh, a number of ex-servicemen living in, British ex-servicemen living in Taiwan, businessmen and so on, had arranged for this memorial service. And uh, they had a piper to play there and uh, a couple of Chinese veterans of the Second World War who were there. And, and I was the only official member of the Commonwealth uh, who, who, who could attend something like that in uniform. And I had agreed to be there and to lay a wreath. And now I'm sitting in hospital. So I decided I'm going to I'm going to attend it anyway. So I I got uh, Christine um, and uh, and uh, I think Jimmy went to the the house and got all my, got my uniform and my medals and everything else and they brought that to the hospital and I spoke to one of the doctors and I said to him, look, this is what I, what I want. are you going to let me go? So he, 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 you know, he, he could see that I was going to go anyway, even if he didn't let me. So, so he said, yes, just don't, don't do anything foolish. Don't overexert yourself and make sure you come back here. So I said, don't worry, I'll make sure of that. And so uh, I dressed in my uniform and uh, Jimmy got a wheelchair and uh, I took a blanket and covered myself with a blanket and I had a baseball cap on and pulled low over my eyes and pulled the blanket right up and, and, and Jimmy got a, a nurse, and uh, in I arranged it as well that it was all sorted out, and the nurse wheeled me out of the front, and there were media people still waiting to get in there to try and photograph us and so on, and they didn't recognize me, and they wheeled me all the way to my official car, and Jimmy helped get me in, and he, he drove me out to Kilung in uh, the area where that little village called uh, Chinguashi, which is where the uh, POW camp used to be and where the memorial uh, is, uh, has been built. And so I went out there, and Jimmy had brought my ash cane, which I carried because I needed to walk with a cane, with, but I was able to walk you know, with, with a bit of difficulty, but I was okay. And, and so I used that, and, uh, and so I attended the service, and I laid the wreath, and the, the other guys were so, so impressed that I'd come. They were really grateful to me. They really appreciated it, and, uh, and it, was, uh, it, it was great. There was some media there, and they were so surprised that, oh, what are you doing here? And, you know, they took a few photographs and so on, and, and, and the next thing I was back in the car, and Jimmy took me back, and again, I covered myself with a blanket and the baseball cap, and, and the nurse came and wheeled me back into the hospital, and we, we slipped away from the guys for that. So um, the hospital, the, 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 the corridors outside our, our wards, 
you, you cannot believe the number of bouquets of flowers, orchids, all sorts of expense. It was just lined with well wishes from all over Taiwan. It was, it was just amazing. Uh, but there was a lot of aftermath, you know. Um, in the first place, I had my last clash with the Directorate of Foreign Relations because what I then found out was that they had sent a message to Shona via uh, the, the commanding officer. A commanding officer called her in and, and uh, um, uh, Commandant Mini, she was at, at uh, I think it was one or two squadron at that stage uh, where she was working. And he called her in and he knew me and he told her that uh, what had happened uh, and said he would notify her of anything else that happened. That's all. They just said we've been taken hostage, but but uh, uh, you know, uh, at this stage there are no there are no no casualties. She didn't know anything else, and they never told her anything else. That that commodore never got hold of her himself, and he never made sure that any messages got to. Her. I don't think he sent any messages. It, it just nothing happened. She was in Hutspreit, which was far away. She eventually went with her the her fiance. And 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 they uh, went. They got leave from the commanding officer, and he let them go back to Pretoria to be with his family, and 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 they watched everything on TV. They could un the only information they got they got on from TV. <clears throat> now, Shona was obviously very upset about that, and and she felt quite resentful because we hadn't actually contacted her. I was under the impression that they they'd kept her fully informed, and she knew exactly what was going on. And as soon as they were able to, they would let her speak to me. That never happened. And when I confronted this, uh, this Commodore, who's now a rank higher than me, uh, I, I said to him, sir, I don't, I don't appreciate the way you've gone to, to work with us. I think you've made a, a hash of this sort of thing. You, 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 you've, you've blown the whole thing. Why didn't you tell my daughter about it? I'd never spoken to a senior officer like the way I spoke to him that day. Uh, and he said, you don't understand. I've got 30 different... Uh, 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 missions around the country, 30 different attaches that I've got to deal with. I can't spend all my attention on one. I said to him, sir, when I was a second lieutenant, I had 34 people under my command in my platoon. I had to know everything about each one of those people. I had to know what their home situation was like. You have no idea what my home situation is like. You've never even spoken to me before since I've been out here. And now you tell me you've got other people, you've got more than 30 people. You've got a second lieutenant's job and you can't do it. And you're a Commodore. Yeah, that, 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 that guy was, we, I was livid because of what he'd done. He was so angry with me. He, put, he, he said to me, we, we're going to give you and your family an opportunity. You can come home to rest for a, for a few weeks. I said to him, sir, don't you understand? I'm in the middle of closing down the office over here. I haven't got time to go on holidays now. You might, not be, you might not be interested in doing your job, but I'm interested in doing my job. I'm closing down this mission before I go back to South Africa. So you can take your holiday and do what you like with it. He ignored me after that. He put down the phone and I never heard another word from him. Never. He never ever came back to me. He never spoke to me when I went back to South Africa. Neither he nor anybody else came near me. That was the end of my, my relationship with DFR, except for Sharon. Sharon still held the fort and still kept us kept us going and and and, and looked after us but nobody else did. nobody else did. that guy he I, I i don't know the man i don't know anything about him uh but that's his fault not mine he was the superior officer and 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 i i, I really got angry with him but i'm not sorry i did and and you know he was very angry with me but that's his that's his business uh, i'm glad that that was the end of my dealings with dfr because as far as, I went, as far as I was concerned, they were a bunch of clowns. But that's just my opinion. You know, who am I? Anyway, um, we didn't want to be, but we'd become celebrities in the Far East. And not just in Taiwan. All over the place. People knew about us. Uh, we were interviewed on TV and on radio. Um, we had invitations to speak, particularly Christine, because when she'd gone out of the garage and refused to go and join the policeman and turned around and gone back in, that had been on TV. The TV screens had taken shown that. And people thought that she was the most wonderful person in the world. 
And she was asked to speak at schools and at churches, and 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 so were we, and Rotary clubs, and 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 all sorts of things. So, uh, you know, we we were speaking to people all over the place. And then our, our our church came to us and said, "Look, we've 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 been thinking a lot about this, and we thought perhaps it would be a good idea if uh, if you made some sort of gesture towards Chin at this stage." So we thought about it, and we decided yes, that's what we would do. So on the 16th of December, now we're getting close to the time we got to go back. I need two weeks to go. Uh, but 16th of December was Anne's 50th birthday. And we managed to get permission to see Chen just before one of his court appearances. And, and we went through and met him in the corridor in shackles and chains uh, as he was about to be to appear before the, 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 the judge for another hearing. And... Um, and and they said to us, you've got you've got three minutes with him. That's all. He's a dangerous man. He's a very dangerous man, and we can't. Uh... So we had taken Chris Dipinar with us, the, uh, the 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 language expert, the, the missionary, and we had got a Chinese Bible, and we'd got a uh, 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 some Chinese tracts explaining the way of salvation, and uh, and we we. Uh, uh, spoke to Anne spoke to him because Anne was the one who had spent the time with him. Uh, Chris's uh, wife had made some some cookies and cakes and so on and, and to, to give him. Uh, but as soon as we produced that, the guards took that away. They said, no, we'll we'll check these first. And then, and then I don't know if they thought we'd put a file in there or something like that, but uh, then, then we'll give it to him. But uh, uh, then Anne, Anne said a couple of things to him because we'd said we, we knew we didn't have time to have a long discussion. So she, she said a few things to him. She, she gave these things to him. She said, the first thing is, we've forgiven you for what you've done to us. We've forgiven you. God will also forgive you if you prepare to accept his son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior. She said, there are not hundreds of lives. You only have this one life. There's no reincarnation. You can't come back later and make up for what you've been done this time. This is the only life there is. And if you don't make your decision now, then you're lost. You need to accept Christ now. And, and before she could say anything more, the God said, no, time's up. You've got to go now. And so they left him. <clears throat> they, took, they, I left, they left us and they took him into the court and, and we had to go. And uh, so um, that was what happened. Uh, but there were other impacts from a Christian point of view. We were contacted by a lot of missionaries. And a lot of them said to us, particularly after we'd been to see Chen and people had seen that we actually went to him and we said to him, we forgive you. And when people asked us about it, we said, no, we've forgiven him for what he did. Um, Christians, missionaries who'd been in Taiwan for 20 years contacted us and said, you know, it's so difficult to witness to a Buddhist. Uh, because to them, they'll accept Jesus, but it's just another another one of the panoply of gods, um, you know. It's and they don't fully understand what is happening, and, and we just can't get people to talk, talk to us about about salvation. She said, but after what happened to you people and the way you reacted towards Chen, said people are coming to us, and they're saying, what is this? Christian love that these people are talking about. What what is this forgiveness that they are talking about? Tell us, tell us about it. We don't understand. Tell us about this. And they said, and we've now got an, an open door to witness to people, and it's making our, our our ministry worthwhile as missionaries in Taiwan. So that was that was very encouraging for us to get that sort of uh, feedback from them. Um, the, there were two Christian videos made of the events. One was called The Longest Day, which was made by the Overseas Radio and Television Incorporated, which is a, a Baptist, uh, not a Baptist, but a, a Christian missionary. Uh, it's a missionary fellowship that, uh, uh, that operates in Taiwan. And the other one was called The Intruder. And it was produced by the Baptist Mass Communication Center and used by them in their training of in their missionary training program. So, so that was very encouraging to, to find that as well. So I then had to <clears throat> finish packing up 
and all the farewells and so on that we had to go, and I had to close down my, my office. Um, of course, what happened to us had a major effect on our family. Um, it was very hard for Melanie to say, I forgive this man. She was very bitter about what he'd done to us as a family and, and, and to us as individuals. Uh, she was very resentful about that. And, and, and we understand that. And, uh, you know, that, that is how, how, how she was affected by it. Uh, Shona was very resentful because we had not, as far as she was concerned, contacted her and kept her in the picture and, and, and shown our concern for her as well during all of this. And everything was just about us in Taiwan and about the family and about uh, what had happened to us. And nobody even uh, thought about her. Uh, certainly, the director of foreign relations never thought about her. It wasn't important to him. <clears throat> um, Christine became a, a huge problem. She um, she had been she was now the center of attraction. Everybody thought she was just the most wonderful person, and uh, she was in demand wherever she went. And if she'd appear in public anywhere, people would look at her and say, "You're Christine. You're Christine." <clears throat> and please sign sign this. Give us a an autograph and so on. And and you know. Children would crowd around her at the schools that she was asked to speak at and so on. And then I was presented with the order of the resplendent banner before I left Taiwan. Now, we had stopped in South Africa, we had stopped presenting the Taiwanese people. Normally, if a Natasha has done a good job, he gets awarded with a, a, a decoration at the end of it by the host country. But we'd stop doing that for the, to the Taiwanese because we were falling over ourselves to please the communist Chinese at that stage. Um, and the, I have no doubt at all that Taiwanese had no intention of giving me a decoration if we were not giving their uh, attaches decorations. Uh, but I think they felt so guilty about what had happened to us and, and were so upset about it that they, uh, they, they, they presented me with the Order of the Splendid Banner and it was... It was a moving formal um, reception, a ceremony, and, uh, and 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 really something quite special. So you know, I wear that thing quite proudly. I'm I'm, I'm proud that they that they did consider giving it to me. Um, <clears throat> so you know, we had we had all of these sort of things going on at the time. Um, we, we, we came back via Hong Kong again. And, uh, you know, even at the airport when we had to leave, we had uh, journalists trying to interview us at the airport. And, when we, and uh, you know, we were so sick and tired of those guys by then. Um, we, were, we, were, uh, we stopped over for a day in, in Hong Kong uh, before we went, took our next flight back. And uh, uh, we were walking down the street in Hong Kong, Kong and people were recognizing uh, Christine and saying, we saw you on television, you're Christine, you know. And Christine just thought that this was wonderful. And uh, when, when we were flying back to South Africa, she said, I suppose when we get to, to South Africa at the airport, there are going to be crowds of people waiting to, to receive her. I said, sweetie, there's not going to be anybody there. She said, no, but we're famous now. The people are all going to see us. They're all going to be pleased to see us back. And I said, sweetie, prepare yourself. There's not going to be anybody there. And when we got back, there was nobody there except Sharon. <laughs> Sharon was the only one there to, to meet us. And she took us to where our car had been stored, and we were able to get that out of storage, and then we were able to leave. Um, I, I was uh, posted to as the SSO Ops at Far North Command. Um, Nobody from DFR, from the, 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 the Directorate of Foreign Relations, ever asked us anything about the hostage. They never came back to it, about the hostage taking. We were never debriefed. Nobody in the Defense Force ever debriefed us. Uh, after, even though special forces had by then been identified as the, 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 the people who would do hostage release, uh, and, and they were responsible for, for doing that in any embassy that uh, where it happened overseas. Um, we weren't interviewed by them. Nobody thought, well, what are the lessons we can learn from this? I wrote a full report about it, a full report and everything, a, a detailed report. And I sent that in to DFR. Never heard a word. Nobody, nobody came back to me. So, you know, uh, my, my, my feeling with, with, with the way that they handled the whole thing was, if that's your attitude, well, 
so much for you. I, 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 I've got, I've got better things to do than waste my time with with clowns like you. <clears throat> so um, we, we, we went to to Petersburg or now Polo uh, went to the headquarters of Far North Command, and uh, I got stuck into my new job there. Um, our, our second daughter Shona got married a month after we returned. <clears throat> Um, you know, for, for Anne especially, uh, what we went through, it was two weeks after her father had died. Um, she'd then seen her, her husband and her daughter getting shot. Uh, the tension of, of 26 hours as a hostage. Uh, um, uh, two weeks after that, uh, little Zachary that we'd had for the past five months or so uh, had to go to, back to, to America or to his new adoptive parents. So it was parting with this little baby, uh, which had become a part of, he'd become a part of our lives. So that was very hard for her. Um, then it was the move, which is always a traumatic uh, experience and settling into a new town and a new house and a, a new community in, in, in Petersburg. Um, there, were, there were so many things happening. And then our youngest daughter's wedding, uh, and, and uh, because we'd been away and so on, we weren't really involved in all the arrangements for the wedding and so on. And, and it, was a, it was a very stressful time for, for us as a family, but particularly for Anne. Um, so, well, surely we were counseled psychologically for all of this. Um, there were no uh, English-speaking counselors in Taiwan. There was nobody who could... Uh, counsel us there. Um, so the first time we received any counseling at all was six months after the event. And, and that was only because, uh, and in Petersburg, I was speaking to the commander of the, 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 the medical command in that area, who had been one of my staff college students. And he was speaking to me and he said to me, who, who debriefed you? Who, who, uh, Vitjela uh, who, 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 who were the people who uh, gave you psychological counseling? I said to him, what psychological counseling? We've had, and he was horrified. He said, you should have had psychological counseling within 24 hours of that happening. You've had no counseling. He said, I'm going to arrange that for you now. So, so he did. But that was six months after it, it had happened. Um, uh, it, 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 it seems that that's a little bit of a contrast uh, when you compare it to, for instance, the, the, the ordeal that uh, uh, Kali and Monique Stradon went through a couple of years later in the year 2000 when they were captured in Malaysia and they were held hostage for four months on the island of Jolo. Now, now on their release, Anne read a report that the SANDF had sent a military psychologist to counsel those people, traumatized South African citizens, but civilians, after their hostage experience. Yet we, who were military people, nobody, the director of foreign relations, you would think that if he was really concerned about it, one of the first things he would have done was to contact the medics and say, can you guys send a guy over there to, to, to debrief them now, to, to counsel them now? Um, I know there's no, nobody in, who's English speaking in, in Taiwan who can do it. Uh, but he wouldn't have known that because he didn't know anything about Taiwan from what I could we really figure out. But anyway, he didn't do that. So, uh, so it was six months later before we got any sort of counseling at all. Uh, we don't know whether there was actually a military psychologist sent for Monique and, and, uh, and, and Kali Stradom. Um, uh, you know, that, that's not mentioned in their book at all. So, you know, probably it, it wasn't. But, but it just gives you, it, 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 it left a bit of a, a bitter residue in, 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 in Annie's psyche. And she had to, you know, she, it added to the fact that she developed severe depression. And from about, about six months after this happened, and, and she was feeling, she was feeling guilty that she'd emerged unscathed out of the, from the gun battle, while her husband and one daughter were both shot and wounded. Um, her other daughter had been bereft of all information of what was going on while we were going through. So for, for about two years, she had to be treated for severe depression as a result. So the whole experience certainly affected our family. It was, 
it was the the commencement of of a period of rebelliousness and, and, and with Christine and and behavioral problems, which eventually led to her getting into drugs and and all sorts of other things. Because she found when she got back, <coughs> she went to the, the to to school in Petersburg. She thought everybody would see her as a celebrity. You know, the kids they, they didn't know anything about it. They didn't know what she. I said to her, "Sweetie, it's a flash in the pan. It's the sort of thing that is headlines in South Africa today." And 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 tomorrow nobody talks about it anymore. In a week's time, everybody's forgotten about it. And you've got to accept that's the way news works. Uh, but but she didn't didn't want to accept that. And and so she started doing things to get attention, because she hasn't wasn't getting the attention she expected she would get, and it led to a, a, a lot of problems with her. Um, and then our, our our eldest daughter, a year later. Uh, she married Michael, who who had been the guy that she contacted in the newsroom and 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 so on. Um, so uh, and he was of course an American. So she went to live in America, which was a loss to us. Uh, but you know, it also gave us lots of opportunities to go to America and to meet people over there and to and to travel a bit. So uh, it wasn't all negative by any means. And of course, they're wonderful opportunities for uh, for our children over there. And you know, I'm wearing Boston University. Uh, uh, hoodie. Now, my eldest daughter, our uh, granddaughter, is at the university at Boston. So, uh, you know, I'm quite chuffed about that. Um, and and uh, you know what what then happened was we got letters from Christian organisations, the prison visitation people in in uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, the pastor who, who who handles that sort of thing, who is still a Facebook friend of mine to, to this day. Uh, we were informed that that Chen Chen Xing, had, as, a, as a result result of their prison ministry uh, and the witnessing that they had done to him, based on what Anna told him when we had met with him and his experience of with us during the hostage taking, taking Chen uh, uh, accepted the Lord and was converted, um, and he, he was uh, uh, he was baptized in the prison and. Uh, and he, 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 we were told that he'd, he'd, he'd led two other prisoners to the Lord as well. So, uh, you know, there, there was a, a dramatic change in his life. Now, it's not for me to say, you know, people say, but how do you know his conversion was genuine? I don't know that. That's between him and the Lord. It's not, it's not for me to say, to judge him for that. Yes, sure. but, but I know that this is, this is what, what happened. He then wrote to, uh, to Anne, he wrote a letter to her which was translated by the Christian Chinese and sent to, to Anne. And, uh, and in it, he asked her if, uh, if she would be prepared to, if we would be prepared to adopt his two sons. Um, we, uh, you know, we considered it very seriously, but we, we realized that at the, at the age that we were at, um, uh, we, you know, we would be in our, in our, in our seventies and have, uh, have teenagers to deal with, um, but uh, I, I have to say that we're now in our seventies, and uh, we've got a seven-year-old that we're looking after now. So, no, I don't know whether whether that was good reasoning on our part at that stage. But anyway, we she, his, his two sons they they were uh, they were victimized in Taiwan because of their father, and they were they eventually were given up for adoption, and they were adopted in uh, in the USA. And uh, went to to Christian families in in the USA. Um, I I uh, I com completed my my honors degree, um, and then I I also was prompted by other people to to write uh, 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 the story of our hostage taking. So it was published. I couldn't get of anyone to publish it in South Africa. Uh, I even uh, contacted Christian book uh, publishers, but they weren't interested. So. Uh, I found a publisher in America, so it was published in America. It is available on uh, from Amazon, and uh, it's also available uh, uh, on uh, what do they call it? Um, Kindle. You can buy a Kindle version, which uh, is generally cheaper than the hard copy. So, um, Chen Chen Shin was tried. Uh, we heard that his wife had was retried and was declared innocent and was released from prison. We also had stories that she was later arrested again and retried and sent to prison, but we don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, Chen himself was tried and he was found guilty of, I don't know, four, four, he, 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 he got four or five death sentences. He got 
uh, you know, uh, five or six life sentences, uh, and he got about 70 or 80 years, other prison sentences and so on. And two years after we'd been uh, taken hostage, he was, uh, he was executed. Um, four years after the incident, we were invited to uh, return to, to Taiwan because uh, a, a, a Chinese language version of our, of our book uh, was published. And we were invited there for the launch of this, this, this book. So we returned to Taiwan, and uh, uh, I was able to speak at the national prayer breakfast that they had there. And uh, we met with the president. It was a new president in Taiwan, and uh, we actually had an audience with him and met with him in, his, uh, in, the, in the presidential palace. And we were hosted in the town of Kaohsiung in the south of Taiwan, where Frank Shear, the lawyer who helped negotiate the release, had become the, uh, the mayor of, uh, of uh, uh, Kaohsiung. So uh, he went on to have a successful political uh, career. And then in, in, in 2007, shortly after I'd, I'd retired from the regular force, we were approached by Raw TV. They were making a series for National Geographic called Locked Up Abroad, and the same series being used for the British Channel 5 TV called Banged Up Abroad. And uh, Anne and I, Christine and I were flown to Johannesburg. We were interviewed for many, many hours over two days. Uh, they only used parts of the interview with me and Christine. They also flew uh, Melanie to London and interviewed her there and also used parts of, of the interview with her. And uh, they, they, our story appeared in the second series, in episode 11 of the second series, uh, where it was entitled uh, Locked Up Abroad Taiwan. Uh, it's a sort of thing that's known as a docudrama. It's a combination of original video footage from the news organizations, uh, interviews with participants, and then reenactments by, by, by professional actors. So very well done, a very, very good, uh, you know, little things I could find fault with, but it, uh, generally I think it was a, a very good uh, portrayal of what, what, what took place. Um, we were contacted by many people as a result of that, and the episode can still be viewed if people go, go into, into the locked up abroad uh, uh, aspect on, on the internet. And then in 2019, 22 years after the incident, we were contacted by an organization known as Peddling Pictures in Singapore. They were producing a series called The Negotiators for Channel News Asia. And they were focusing on how negotiations were carried out during crisis situations. And so we were flown to Singapore for three days and we were interviewed at length over there. I was as sick as a dog. I had a mouthful of sores and, and I, was, I really felt ill and I had difficulty speaking. Uh, but they were determined to, to interview us, and they did. And they, they, I think, despite of the fact that I looked like a, an old man about, about, to, about to expire because of my illness and that I had great difficulty articulating my words, uh, I think they did a very good job. It was only a four-episode series. Uh, ours was a, the, the first one, and it was called the Taipei Hostage Crisis. It was also a docudrama, also involved original footage, as well as uh, uh, interviews, as well as uh, uh, portrayals by, by professional actors. And uh, the following year, in, in, in 2000, uh, that production won a Rocky Award for Excellence in Global Television and, and Digital Content in the, the Documentary and Factual Crime and Investigation category. So that's also available on the internet and can be viewed. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Chris, that, that brings us to the end of the, uh, the drama. And I'm sorry I've really gone on for a long time, but uh, it was really important that I, I think that I, uh, that I tried to get across because a lot of people ask a lot of questions about this. And I can tell you, I haven't even covered half of what actually happened, but I managed to put quite a lot into the book, although my, my editor for the publishers also cut out some of the stuff that I put in there as well. So, uh, But it's, it's a pretty good portrayal in the book. So. And if it's, it's all right with you, uh, in the next episode, which will probably be the last one I'll need to give um, to complete my career, I'll speak about my time as the SSO Ops at Far North Command, uh, when I was appointed later as commander of the Richmond Task Group, uh, my promotion to a general officer, 
and uh, my time at the Regional Joint Task Force South, and also later as the Director of Doctrine Development at Joint Ops. I'll also speak about my uh, master's degree and my PhD, and uh, my term in the Reserve Force after I'd retired. So uh, that that I can we can hopefully do next week. Well, internet, we've come to the end of the hostage one. I can tell you this is a fantastic story. So we're very grateful God was with you that day. And we're grateful that he was with your children also. And I think all of us believe in Jesus in this program and on the channel. And we're grateful. We're very grateful for your testimony. So it's one of the most powerful ones I've ever heard in my life. And I'm really privileged and I can tell you, I, I hope a lot of people look at this and while I wish not that on anybody, but if you should be in a situation like that, look up. Yeah, I mean, you amen. know where it's going to come from. And until we meet again, all of you, God bless.